Live from RT headquarters, I'm Anissa Nawe. Today, ISIS claims war on America. Our RT reporter flees Ukraine after death threats. And the Iraqi journalist who threw his shoe at President George W. Bush is in the now. ISIS in America. What a thought. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for an attack on an exhibition in Texas that featured cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. The announcement was made on the group's radio station with warnings that more attacks are to come. Well, the first attacker was identified as American Elton Simpson, who converted to Islam at a young age. He'd previously been investigated for terrorism by the FBI, and shortly before the attack, he tweeted messages with the hashtag Texas Attack. The second gunman was Simpson's roommate, Nadir Hamid Sufi. Born in Texas, he lived in Pakistan for some time, but had never been on the FBI's radar. Joining us in the now is Dr. Doug Weeks, research fellow at the London Metropolitan University. Thanks for being with us. In a radio broadcast, ISIS <laughs> says that this was their doing in Texas. The two gunmen who opened fire there were referred to as soldiers and brothers. Should there be any doubt in the world that this was Islamic State? And if so, why hasn't Obama spoken yet? Well, I can't uh, speak for the President of the United States. You'll have to ask him that question yourself. But certainly, um, I don't think that it is necessarily surprising that ISIS would want to take uh, credit for this. Now, whether or not they actually had any real involvement uh, remains to be seen. And I've only seen one report so far that has attributed uh, this attack to ISIS. Um, so I think there is still a lot that remains to be un uncovered here. Is there a chance that this wasn't ISIS, but radicalized Americans? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Is there a chance, a good chance, that this was radicalized Americans if it wasn't actually ISIS's work? Well, yes, I, I think that that is uh, always a possibility. And I think that when you look at these types of attacks that have been occurring around the world with uh, increasing frequency lately, um, then there is always the, um, I think, the, the real reality that people are responding in violent ways to uh, perceptions of what they have uh, in terms of what's going on in the world. And certainly this issue of creating uh, caricatures of uh, the prophet um, has been proven time and again to be extraordinarily offensive to Muslims around the globe. And it's not surprising that a few of them are going to potentially react poorly um, and violently, as was the case, unfortunately, again here in Garland, Texas, uh, the other day. Talking about responses and reaction, the U.S. has been criticized over its military involvement in the Mideast for decades now. Is it unfair to connect interventions to the growth of radicals around the world and, of course, what we're seeing unfold in America? Well, I, I think there's a lot of things that actually um, facilitate radicalization, if you will, in whatever sector of society that you want to look at. More specifically within uh, what is often termed Islamic radicalization um, is often conflated to mean a number of things, uh, not, uh, not certainly uh, without um, uh, pointers to uh, U.S. and other Western power foreign policy. However, uh, at least in my research and the people that I interact with uh, on a pretty regular basis, uh, what I see is that there are any number of reasons people ultimately radicalize. Some of them may be international events, some may be domestic events, some may be things that are going on within their personal lives, uh, but all lead to a sense of frustration and anger. Um, what you really see, um, quite frankly, with regards to uh, those that are Muslim who radicalize is that when they do, um, very rarely do you find many that have much of a Islamic background or 
a fervent uh, religious ideology. Um, they may be Muslim in terms of uh, they were born or come from Muslim families or come from Muslim countries, uh, but more often than not, their grievances um, come from a wide variety of ranges. And ultimately, what, um, what I think is often misconceived is that they radicalize because of religion. And quite honestly, that's just not true. Right, of course, there's millions of Muslims around the world that haven't been radicalized. And if you don't agree with a direct correlation between military intervention and the radicalization uh, and violence that we're seeing around the world, what about the fact that Islamic State itself basically says this is the reason behind its uh, attempt to make gains across the world, the fact that the U.S. Uh, and, its, and its actions in the Middle East, I mean, they directly link it to them. Just briefly, can you comment on that? Well, I, I think uh, you have to, uh, like anything, uh, any public statements from any group, uh, whether that be ISIS or, or any others that are operating out there, I think you have to um, take them with a certain degree of measurement in that just because they say it doesn't mean that it's true. But there are plenty now, of non-terrorist uh, experts around the world who have uh, created a direct correlation between the occupation of Iraq, Afghanistan, with a rise in radicalism. It's not just terrorists who claim this. No, absolutely, and, and I, that was where I was going to go with my comment, is um, there is no doubt that people are reacting negatively um, to uh, international events, and certainly uh, those that are led by the U.S. and its coalition partners around the globe. Um, but that is not the sole and only source of radicalization. That is just one of many. All right, Dr. Doug Weeks, a fe research fellow at London Metropolitan University with us in the now from the British capital. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, we're talking about U.S. interventions and how they backfire. Remember this? <laughs> Joining us in the now is that very Iraqi journalist who threw his shoe at George W. Bush, Muntadir Zaidi. Tell us, why did you do it? I did it because of the lies coming from George Bush, who told audiences that Iraqi citizens received him with roses. I did it also because of the killing of more than 1.5 million Iraqis and the displacement of more than 5 million others, as well as the making of more than 5 million children into orphans without a home and more than 5 million women left as widows. And all that in addition to the theft of Iraq's national resources and the destruction and splitting up of the country. So this obviously wasn't something that you planned. It was an emotional, in-the-moment decision to react, yes? No, no, no. On the contrary, this action was planned in advance. Maybe I'm revealing that for the first time to the media. I kept a videotape which would have been published in case of my assassination, but I wasn't killed, therefore this video is still in my possession. I have been concealing the video in order to publish it if the American occupation authorities call for the continuation of my legal persecution. Wow, so you thought that you would be killed after that and left a message, I assume, to your family, a kind of um, your words to pass on. Tell us, what, what kind of treatment did you face after you threw the shoe? The treatment was cruel. There was beating and whipping. They broke my nose and teeth and leg. They also used electroshocks on me. I received all kinds of torture. I witnessed it with my naked eyes. How do people react to you in Iraq? I mean, not the government, not officially, but the people of the country. Are you seen as some sort of hero? I've already said I'm not a hero, but I do represent the feelings of the whole Iraqi people. All Iraqi ethnicities and sections went to the streets to say that all of them are like me, Muntada. They support what I did because it represents Iraqis, not another state or someone in outer space. I'm an Iraqi, and the demonstrations confirmed my people will fight the U.S. occupation of Iraq. 
I have to ask you just finally, would you throw it again? Would you do this again if you had the chance? I'm not alone in this world. What do you mean by that? There will be another like me. All right, Iraqi journalist Muntadir Zaidi. He will long be remembered, of course, for throwing his shoe at President George W. Bush. Thanks so much for being in the now. Shukran. Tahayati. Well, we promised you this yesterday, but never got to it. So forgive us. Today, it's certainly coming up. How old are you? Went viral. But guess who then has the right to all those pictures? Stay in the now. On the 8th of May, RT will host a Google Hangout with World War II veterans who survived war horrors to become real heroes at a young age. RT offers you a rare chance to speak with the veterans, submit your questions, and express your gratitude. on how the British press accused a Russian newspaper of conspiracy theories about the royal baby, while the conspiracy themselves were coming from the comment section of the article. Well, the fake story spilled over borders. The Huffington Post picked it up. Russians are not buying Kate Middleton's glowing beauty. However, this outlet does mention that it's people's comments, not the newspaper's reporting. Here's to honesty. Unlike these guys, now news this. Now this news, rather, of MSNBC, they don't seem to bother with the facts. Once again, the Russian newspaper they cite didn't report this. A user comment on the article turned into accusations a pro-Kremlin publication was making things up. Clear proof this twist is political. Well, we wrote to now this asking if they knew the post was misleading. Initially, their headline pointed fingers at the Russian media, as you can see here. They changed it after we wrote, saying some Russians, much more general. As for the misleading video below, well, the company says they'll stick to it even after we point it out. It's not true. So this goes to you. Now this. <laughs> But there are some online user comments that do deserve attention. RT correspondent and my colleague Paula Sleer had to cut her work in Ukraine short and leave the country. All after a popular Ukrainian blogger wrote a hate post about her saying she's not wanted. Well that, it sparked an avalanche of comments, including some of these. Calls to catch Paula, threats to actually beat her up and leave her disfigured for life. Others wrote that she should be chased away by missiles. Hate language all over the place. But the worst was on Twitter. Actual death threats to Paula Sleer. 
Joining me in the now is Vladimir Radzianko from Russia Insider. Vladimir, it's not the first time journalists from Russian news outlets are facing problems in Ukraine. Some Russian teams were held hostage by Ukrainian security forces. Others denied entry into the country. And now our colleague receiving death threats. What does this say about the situation? Well, Anissa, it's a terrible, terrible situation. And what happened to your colleague, Paula, is uh, quite frankly unforgivable and and really uh, appalling because you, well, you could also take it with a, the, see the silver lining is that even though that she is getting these death threats you can you can see that she is telling the truth and she is doing the job that needs to happen and uh, I think as far as for most of the Russian journalists that are in Ukraine it's extremely dangerous because they are there telling the story trying to get the truth out um, and also because the Russian people do support the people of Donbass, um, it's it's kind of a way of a, of a shakedown to to scare not only Russians away, but also any other Western or uh, Western journalists for that matter, uh, coming to the region to report on the truth. So, where do you think this negative attitude comes from? Is it the government? Is it embedded in the people? Are Ukrainian people getting any of what's happening in the East through their media? Sure, absolutely. I, I think it's probably a combination of the both. Um, I think uh, I think there was kind of a, um, a, a cooler heads uh, before Maidan, where the people and the government would uh, would live side by side with Russian speakers in Ukraine. And now, since Maidan, quite frankly, with the uh, far right groups like uh, Svoboda Party and uh, Pravda Sector, the right sector. Um, they are scaring the current government now so that if, uh, if anything were to happen to make sure that the people are there and uh, if anything, if they were to change their stance at all on Donbass or on Russia, that they would commit another Maidan. So you have kind of uh, the, the, the two hand in hand, the government and the people both trying to demonize uh, the so-called terrorists that you have in Donbass and Russia and Putin and essentially everybody that has anything to do with Donbass who, who are supporting those civilians who are who are being bombed and and it's just quite uh, it's just a uh, it's a it's absolute just dev devastation that's happening there yeah this media war which you of course at Russia Insider keep very close track of has been fierce there's been accusations on both sides there's been uh, false claims on both sides, let's be honest. Uh, it's clearly hard for Russian journalists to work in Ukraine, but what about Ukrainian journalists? Just recently, opposition journalists were persecuted. Uh, Oleg Buzina was shot dead on the streets, and we've heard very little mm. about this in the Western press. Yeah, it's, uh, again, that is also very appalling and unforgivable because anything that happens uh, like that with some of the other journalists and some of the other uh, uh, Russian-leaning uh, Ukrainians in the uh, in in Kiev uh, are being persecuted and are being murdered. Quite frankly, and and, and it's uh, let's not be uh, light about it. They are being murdered for their for their views, um, and it's it's almost a, as a shakedown uh, again to these to to the Russian supporters and to any Westerners who are want to want to tell the truth about what's happening in Ukraine. But uh, go back to your your point. Uh, I believe that. Uh, the Westerners uh, in Ukraine and, and the Westerners uh, in, in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, are basically watching what's happening and what's unfolding um, in, in Ukraine right now. And uh, when they cover things like uh, uh, basically with the Russian uh, media and uh, what alternative media are covering Odessa massacre or MH17 uh, when we're still trying to figure out where, what, what had happened to the, uh, the downing of the plane there and also uh, what happened in, um, in, uh, with the uh, various Ukrainian journalists and pro-Russian journalists like uh, Andrei Stenin uh, when he was murdered in, uh, in Ukraine and a lot of these things are not coming out in the Western press and it's, it's really uh, an injustice and um, it's really embarrassing for anybody that calls themselves journalists not to be covering these really, really important stories. Hey, Vladimir Rodzianko from Russia Insider with us in the now. Thanks so much for your analysis. Thanks, Nisa. Well, it looks like uh, the tax the rich supporter and billionaire George Soros will have to pay some hefty taxes himself. A deadline for offshore lovers uh, seen by Congress runs out in 2017, and George Soros reportedly owes up to $7 billion. <laughs> You 
course, you support President Obama's proposal to increase taxes on the wealthy. Yes, I, I very much do, do, do so. It's fair. Uh, it, uh, speaking as a person who would probably be most hurt by this. Elections are coming up. Lots of money is being thrown around by the Soruses of the world. Some unofficial primaries have already taken place. One American billionaire has gotten a head start. Here's the resident, Lori Harfinist, with all you need to know. Did you know that billionaire Sheldon Adelson just held what's become known as the Sheldon primary in Las Vegas? It's a big event where Republican presidential candidates all fly in to attend golf outings, scotch tastings, fancy dinners, and one-on-one -on -one meetings with Adelson to try to win his support so that he'll give them lots of money for their campaign. To get his money, all a candidate needs to do is follow a few of Adelson's political beliefs, like forgetting about negotiating with Iran and just firing nukes at them. You call somewhere in Nebraska and you say, OK, let it go. So there's an atomic weapon goes over ballistic missiles in the middle of the, the, middle of the desert, and then you say, see, the next one is in the middle of the terrorism. So this Las Vegas billionaire wants to end nuclear talks with Tehran and just start nuking. It's looking like Marco Rubio did the best at the Sheldon primary. So you think he's going to push extra hard now for ending nuke talks with Iran just to stay in line with what the casino mogul wants? I'd say that's something you can bet on. I'm the resident, and now you're in the know. I was obsessed with this app the whole weekend, and I know many of you were, and you tried it. How old are you? Or should I say... How old are they? But did you know that the app is owned by Microsoft? corporation can use your pictures anywhere on the internet once you upload them. Millions scored just this weekend. Another reason why you should actually read terms and conditions. You've been in the now. I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, it's now or never.